Hi everybody, this is part seven in a seven part series on the theme debating democracy. We've covered a lot of ground in this series following mostly the presentation of Jason Brennan in his excellent book, Democracy, A Guided Tour. Uh, in this one, we're going to depart uh, from Brennan and look at two recent books um, that examine the, I'm calling them threats and prospects uh, of uh, toward and of democracy today. At the end, we'll look at some of the themes that have been covered in this series as a whole and uh, wrap things up. So let's get started. Here we have the covers of, of the two books and some images of their, of their primary authors. On the left, we have Four Threats by Mettler and Lieberman. Uh, and on the right, we have How Democracies Die by Levitsky and Ziblatt. So we'll take a look at both of those uh, in the first part of these remarks. The books were published um, after Brexit, after the 2016 election, in a time when many people were reflecting on the strength of democracy, on threats to democracy, or if you like, even just on the nature of democracy. Populist movements had gained a great deal of prominence, of course, in that period, and <clears throat> in some respects still enjoy that prominence today, and when we shall see how things develop in, in the 2024 election cycle in the United States and, and elsewhere. Uh, but these books um, take an historical perspective. The, the first that we're going to look at, How Democracies Die by Levitsky and Ziblatt, look at an international context, and we're just going to look at a couple chapters. I, I believe it's one and eight from that book. Um, the four, book Four Threats by Mettler and Lieberman focuses on the United States, and those are four threats specific to American democracy. So we're not going to be commenting in uh, enormous detail on, on these two works, uh, but we will uh, basically recommend these books to your attention. They're excellent studies and have been uh, very well received, uh, as well as enjoying uh, great sales. Um, okay, so starting off with um, Levitsky and, and Zibelat, um, that's uh, Dr. Levitsky on, on the left and, and Dr. Zibelat on the, on the right. How Democracies Die. <clears throat> The book opens effectively, to my mind, diving right into an historical event, and that is the military coup in Chile uh, when Salvador Allende was um, ousted uh, from power. Uh, this is, the authors suggest, how we tend to think democracies die. There is a, a coup, or there's some kind of military uh, event, and the democratically elected leader or leaders are, are ousted from power. And this is kind of how it's happened for the last century or so. However, um, their main contention in the book, if you take anything from this, how do democracies die, their main contention is that's just not generally how it happens anymore. Sure, it sometimes happens that way. But today, democracies tend to erode, erode there's a, I believe, do they use the image? They should if they don't, perhaps. Um, the boiling of a frog, yes? So you start with room temperature water, the frog is perfectly happy, and you turn up the heat, you turn up the heat, you turn up the heat. Frog does not perceive that change in heat until it is too late, and uh, God bless him, the frog dies. This, they think, is how democracy dies today. There's a slow process. Uh, there are two tests to see if you're on the way to this, and, and they base this on a real wealth of historical research that we're going to just touch on in these remarks. Does an autocrat get elected in the first place, or a person, say, with an autocratic personality, autocratic tendencies? And if so, are steps taken to constrain him or her? The authors emphasize the value of political parties, in fact, here, the, the gatekeepers uh, that uh, protect uh, the institutions from capture by individuals or uh, factions that would uh, challenge them fundamentally or threaten the stability of the society. There are two basic norms that they emphasize here, and this is basically in the first chapter of their book, and I, I think it's a useful pairing. Mutual toleration and what they call institutional forbearance. So mutual toleration is exactly what it would sound like. Don't regard your opponents as evil enemies, um, but regard and actively treat them as perhaps as opponents, but as fellow citizens and, and, and seek to tolerate their views rather than demonizing them. 
Institutional forbearance here refers to the um, practice of an institution, Congress or some agency, even though they might have the legal authority to do something, it is technically within their power to do something, they forbear from doing it. They, they decline to exercise the full scope of their authority in order that the spirit of the law should be uh, realized. Right, so, so they could do it, but they're not going to, right? And the argument of Levitsky and, and Ziblatt here in their book is that these two norms are what hold democracies together. Um, if you have uh, a loss of toleration or the ability to practice toleration, if you have a loss of institutional forbearance and institutions are, are using the letter of the law to enact policies or take steps that go against the spirit, so, so to speak, of the law, you have trouble. Quote from the book, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. The promise of history and the hope of this book is that we can find the rhymes before it is too late. So what are they seeking? Uh, uh, what is rhyming here? Various instances of democratic kind of collapse, uh, or, or we should say decay, um, over the, excuse me, past century or so. Chapter one, Mussolini, Hitler, Hugo Chavez. They look at the ways in which these three individuals rose to power. They, they rose to power by democratic means, uh, and thereafter, um, as we are aware, uh, began to act in ways that are not uh, able to be regarded as, as democratic. Um, they point out in their discussion of all three of these, and I would just highlight this point, that in all cases, established kind of leaders in, in the political system uh, open the door or actively put these individuals in power. They did not crash the gates, right? They were invited in for various reasons. And this is, I think, a useful um, uh, lesson to be derived here that uh, existing institutions um, do function as, as gatekeepers. And when that gate is opened, um, uh, different things will happen. Uh, however, one might feel about those. Uh, objectively, they do threaten the ability of a society to be regarded as a, as a democracy. But they write, not all democracies have fallen into this trap, such as we see in Mussolini and Chavez and Hitler's cases. Uh, some, including Belgium, Britain, Costa Rica, Finland, have faced challenges from demagogues, but also have managed to keep them out of power. And they highlight especially here the case of, of Belgium and of Finland. The case of Belgium is, is, is an interesting one because there you have, uh, in the 1930s, uh, a Catholic, populist, fascist leader who is rejected by the Catholic party in Belgium. The Catholics actually choose to side with the socialists against this fascist leader because they regard his policies as, as unacceptable. So, so there you have a group actually siding with their supposed opponent, right, the socialists, um, against was supposedly one of their own, uh, this, this Catholic, um, parentheses, fascist politician uh, in order to protect the institutions of the society. And certainly that's something to keep in mind. There are four signs Levitsky and Ziblatt identify, and, and this is a chart taken straight from the, the text of their book. Um, and I'll just, um, well, I think it would make most sense just to read these briefly and, and consider each of them. Uh, so uh, re rejection of or weak commitment to democratic rules of the game. This is something, when you see it, uh, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have democratic, they call it backsliding, which is the term in the literature, democratic decay. Your democracy might die, right? Uh, the questions associated with the first one here. Do they reject the Constitution or express a willingness to violate it? Do they, and they in all of these cases, are the, are the individuals who have come to power, uh, perhaps a demagogue, perhaps a populist party, uh, otherwise someone who is threatening democracy in the country? Do they suggest a need for anti-democratic measures, such as canceling elections, violating or suspending the Constitution, banning certain organizations, or restricting basic civil and political rights? Do they seek to use or endorse the use of extra-constitutional means to change the government, such as military coups, violent insurrections, or mass protests aimed at forcing a change in the government? Do they attempt to undermine the legitimacy of elections, for example, by refusing to accept 
credible electoral result. And we should note this was written well before the 2020 election. So any of these, if, if the answer is yes to any of these, um, you're in danger. We, what we have here are questioning, uh, uh, a, a questioning of the rules of the game, the Constitution, the basic norms that structure that political society. Number two, denial of the legitimacy of political opponents. Not denying that they are opponents, they could be opponents, but are they even legitimate? Questions. Do they describe their rivals as subversive or opposed to the existing constitutional order? Right? You, you are anti-American. Do they claim that their rivals constitute an existential threat, either to democratic secu uh, to national security or to the prevailing way of life? Do they baselessly describe their partisan rivals as criminals whose supposed violation of the law or potential to do so disqualifies them from full participation in the political arena? Do they baselessly suggest that their rivals are foreign agents in that they are secretly working in alliance with or the employ of a foreign government, usually an enemy one? So in all of these cases, so in the first case we saw they were questioning the Constitution, the basic rules of the game. In the second case, they're, they're not engaging with their opponents as opponents. They're, they're trying to, in effect, dehumanize their opponents, make them not legitimate, make them unable to even be dealt with. Uh, regardless of what their policies might be. Two more, toleration or encouragement of violence. Uh, once the speaking stops, the fighting starts, as, as we unfortunately are all too aware. Do they have any ties to armed gangs, paramilitary forces, militias, guerrillas, or other organizations that engage in illicit violence? Have they or their partisan allies sponsored or encouraged mob attacks on opponents? Have they tacitly endorsed violence by their supporters by refusing to unambiguously condemn it and punish it? And last, have they praised or refused to condemn other significant acts of political violence, either in the past or elsewhere in the world? If, they, if the answer is yes to any of these questions, we're playing a dangerous game. We're on the way to democratic decay, democratic death. Institutions are being, are being threatened. Last one, readiness to curtail civil liberties of opponents, including media. And I think that, that including media is important here. A few questions. Have they supported laws or policies that restrict civil liberties, such as expanded libel or defamation laws, or laws restricting, um, laws restricting protest, criticism of the government, or certain civic or political organizations? Two, have they threatened to take legal or other punitive action against critics and rival parties, civil society, or the media? And three, finally, have they praised repressive measures taken by other governments either in the past or elsewhere in the world? Uh, so whenever, I mean, there might be reason to question the mainstream media. Uh, however, when the very legitimacy of the media is questioned, when, when journalists are not treated or recognized as journalists, uh, but as, as somehow uh, corrupt agents of, a, of a, some uh, background power, you're in danger, you're in trouble, things are unstable, and you better, you better watch out. Uh, the last chapter in this book, How Democracies Die, and this will be our, our last comment on this, um, uh, focuses on the possible futures. What can be done, as, as one would expect from the last chapter of a book such as this? Um, the authors identify here uh, at the time of, of publication, again, before the 2020 election, possible futures for a post-Trump America. President Trump was in office at that time. Um, they identify Three, the most optimistic, and from their point of view, resurgent democracy. Uh, so this this uh, period of challenge to democratic institutions is regarded as kind of an unfortunate blip. Uh, nationalist entrenchment, uh, where the, there's a continued uh, escalation of uh, energies uh, that threaten um, democracy. Or what they regard as most likely, the third of these more polarization, uh, just each side strengthening and strengthening and, and, and becoming more and more opposed to the other. And it certain, I, I would hazard that that third has indeed, as they predict, come, come to pass at least. And we can question the extent to which the first, the first two have, or we can debate that. Quote from the book, when American democracy has worked, it was relied upon two norms, 
that we often take for granted, mutual tolerance and institutional forbearance. So again, this, this, is, this is not a game where you're trying to you know, you know, use every technicality and every rule to get the outcome you want. There has to be a certain quote-unquote spirit of the thing. And finally, um, they question kind of what de Democrats, that is members of the Democratic Party, should do in the face of the challenges that they that they faced. Uh, and, and the first option, uh, and they kind of take issue with both of these, they disagree with them, to fight like Republicans. Um, so the, some of the chapter and, and discussion in this book is, is devoted to the work of, of Newt Gingrich and other Republican Congress people who throughout the 70s, 80s, and, and 90s worked to promote a, a kind of polarization as, as part of a strategy of um, uh, shifting the, the balance of, of power in Washington. And to my understanding, that's an uncontroversial claim uh, describing their uh, strategy. Uh, the, the alternative to this, and since they don't think the Democrats should engage in that same kind of strategy, uh, is that Democrats might abandon quote-unquote identity politics and moderate their stance on immigration to win back white working class voters. And this was something discussed uh, after the 2016 election when, when Hillary Clinton was defeated in the Electoral College by by President Trump. Um, they also uh, believe that this is, is not the right way to go. Uh, they don't, they don't on, on my reading, have a, a definite you know, recipe for moving forward, uh, but I guess that is something that would need to be recalculated, as it were, now anyway. I mean, things are moving so fast that even a book published just a few years ago is in danger of being dated quickly. I want to conclude the discussion of this by reproducing a quotation from the author E.B. White um, that the authors um, include in Chapter 8, and they discuss this a bit. I, th I think it's a beautiful quotation. It was submitted to the, uh, uh, the, the, the War Board, I believe it was 1942 or 3, uh, the middle of World War II. Um, this, um, this body uh, asked E.B. White, to tell them <laughs> what democracy is. Uh, one imagines because they were looking to find ways to promote um, democracy in the ideological battle that, that accompanied the American effort in that conflict. Uh, so E.B. White uh, writes, at least in part, and it's implied in the text in full, uh, in the following way. Surely the board knows what democracy is. Democracy is the line that forms on the right. It is the don't in don't shove. It is the hole in the stuffed shirt through which the sawdust slowly trickles. It is the dent in the high hat. Democracy is the recurrent suspicion that more than half of the people are right more than half of the time. It is the feeling of privacy in the voting booths, the feeling of communion in the libraries, the feeling of vitality everywhere. Democracy is a letter to the editor. Democracy is the score at the beginning of the ninth. It is an idea which hasn't been disproved yet, a song, the words of which have not gone bad. It's the mustard on the hot dog and the cream in the rationed coffee. Democracy is a request from the war board in the middle of a morning, in the middle of a war, wanting to know what democracy is. I, I find it to be beautiful, and one could go, go ahead and comment in more detail on all of this, but I, I think in the interest of, of time, I will leave it to, to your interpretation. I mean, certainly that last sentence does stand out. Any war board, any government body, which in the middle of a morning, in the middle of a war, would ask a writer to tell them what democracy is. <laughs> a writer, and this is a, it's a remarkable thing, and uh, certainly worthy of White's um, emphasis on it. So here we have uh, Mettler and, and Lieberman, authors, um, main authors of this book, Four Threats, and the subtitle of that book is The Recurring Crises of American Democracy. So as Levitsky and, uh, Levitsky and Ziblatt focused on the international context and, and spanning the, the last century or so especially, um, these authors are also looking at history, but they're looking at the American context, and they're looking at the history of the United States since its, um, since its founding. 
The authors write the following here in the first chapter of the book. The United States has not always been democratic. American democracy has not developed through steady progress over time. We, well, what do we hear said? This, the United States is a, a democratic republic, right? So all, already uh, at the founding of the country, I mean, we, we did not have a direct election of senators. We, we have an electoral college. We have Supreme Court that is com composed of individuals uh, appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate, which was originally an unelected body, right? So democracy in the United States, and it certainly pertains to the uh, the popular vote in a presidential election. It, it pertains to all the operations of government at the local and, and state levels in various degrees. Um, but it, it primarily uh, w w was placed in the House of Representatives at, at the beginning until the direct election of, of senators was, um, was established. Uh, so there's always been an effort to, to check the energies of, of democracy, and certainly it has not been a steady increase, and certainly it has not been as simple or straightforward as would be suggested by the customary rhetoric related to democracy that we see employed. Four key attributes are identified by these authors, attributes of functioning democratic systems. Uh, these are clear indicators, they say, that we can use as standards to assess whether democracy is advancing or retreating in every, any given period of history. And pause, that is a major feature of the author's work, that democracy is not simply steadily increasing. We do not see an arc of history uh, consistently tending toward justice. Uh, maybe it is ultimately tending toward justice, but it wends and weaves. Um, to, to, to judge where you are in that wending weaving pattern, they consider the following factors, free and fair elections, rule of law, legitimacy of the opposition, and integrity of rights. We've seen these four discussed in various contexts. We've had a discussion of rule of law specifically earlier in this series, legitimacy of the opposition we discussed even just a few moments ago in relation to Levitsky and Ziblatt's book. They continue, however, beyond those four attributes, the kind of litmus tests for um, democratic advancement. They uh, focus here on the title, title track of the book. We discern four major threats that can endanger democracy. Uh, and these four threats are the following, and they're the ones referred to in the title. Political polarization, one. Two, conflict over who belongs in the political community. Three, high and rising levels of economic inequality. And four, executive aggrandizement, that is the expansion of the power of the executive branch and specifically the office of the president. They, uh, they, they argue here, and this is, this is kind of the thesis of the book, today, for the first time ever, we face the confluence of all four threats at once. All the ingredients for democratic backsliding are in place. Now, they're, they're, they're looking, again, at the span of history of, of the American Republic, and they identify uh, the present moment, uh, the 2010s le leading up to the elections of 2016, 2020, um, as uh, a period when all four of these things are in play. There is enormous polarization. There is conflict over who is fully a member of the political Community, and this relates to questions about immigration and, and such things. There is rising economic inequality, and there is uh, and has been for a long time an expansion of the power of the executive. Uh, so these four threats are in place, and, uh, and we're off to the races. From early on, they write, uh, and this is in the, the final chapter of their book, so, so that, of course, they, they set out those four threats at the beginning, and then if, if you're interested, you get the book, they talk about each of those historical periods indicated on the last slide and how each of those four threats were in play in various places, um, yielding uh, really fascinating lessons and, and highly instructive lessons about how to navigate our current moment. Uh, they write here in the, in the final chapter, from early on, President Donald Trump showed a willingness to put the pillars of democracy at risk. Um, so, you know, spoiler, the chapter is highly critical of President Trump, but I would, I would submit not in a narrowly partisan way, uh, but in a way that is fully conversant with the analytical framework they've set out in reference to these four threats. I mean, they're, they're showing how specifically these things were uh, exacerbated during the administration of, of uh, Donald Trump. Um, 
Further on, as all four threats reached high velocity and in combination generated even greater momentum, the embattled political system showed a profound lack of capacity to rein in the president. Here we hear an echo of uh, what Levitsky and Ziblatt pointed out concerning the gatekeeping role of political elites and established political parties. Um, if those parties, uh, for reason of uh, you know ad advancing their platform or interests, uh, compromise in the election of an individual who uh, does not uphold democratic norms, uh, this will lead, uh, or historically one should say, has led to what we call democratic backsliding. In the chapter, this final chapter of their book, the authors walk through all four of these threats that they've been discussing throughout, and they trace how each of these reached, uh, as I put it here, a fever pitch in the 2010s, um, leading uh, to and, and supporting um, uh, Donald Trump's campaign for president uh, in 2015 uh, and to the election, of course, in 2016. Friends, that's what I have to say about those two books. I, I, I highly recommend them to you. How Democracies Die by Levitsky and Ziblatt and Four Threats by Mettler and Lieberman. They're very, they remain today, um, because of their historical focus, really useful takes on our present situation, at least in my estimation. Here on the screen, we have, again, Jason Brennan's uh, book, as well as the book, the cover of the course reader um, that accompanies this series. And I have just a couple slides. I just want to revisit some of the themes that we've seen and, and see kind of where we've been uh, over the course of this seven-part series. Uh, we started um, by looking at these four, uh, the actually should be five themes in relation to democracy today, following Brennan's book, and that's published by Oxford 2023, recommended to your purchasing uh, attention. Stability, virtue, wisdom, freedom, equality, and the way Brennan set it up, it's for and against, for and against, right? And we saw that in each of these areas throughout history, uh, there has been a lot of energy on both sides of those debates. I mean, Plato and his kind of progeny emerge as a consistent, uh, emerges as a consistent opponent of of what, at least what he calls democracy, what we might call mob rule, uh, whereas uh, on the other side you have you have thinkers even like Lysander Spooner or uh, Thomas Paine, uh, champions of democracy, who regard these um, these uh, themes as as being supported uh, by by that form of government. Uh, in the middle, you have someone like Tocqueville. We're going to walk through some of our primary sources in a minute, but Tocqueville is really kind of a motivator for this. For this series, in that he's he's I don't want to say he's on the fence because it sounds like he's wishy-washy about it. He's not wishy-washy, but he sees both sides, right? He sees the inevitability and the desirability of democracy, yet as well he sees the threats um, that democracy can pose. Um, and we saw that in our discussion of his his idea of uh, quote unquote despotism, the the kind of despotism that democracies have to fear, or his discussion of the tyranny of the majority. So you know what does Tocqueville say? Yes, democracy. Yes, please, more. Uh, but as you do, take care, right? Take care because there are dangers in democracy just as there are in in any other form of government. Um, we've also, as the slide here says, uh, studied a wide range of primary sources. We started with Pericles in ancient Athens, and, and we moved up to to Thomas Christiano. Um, in the present, I, I just take a look. We're not going to talk about each one of these, of course. There are 45 different readings, holy moly. Um, but to, just to kind of group them and, and comment a bit. So in numbers one through nine here, focus on Pericles, Plato, and, and Aristotle, primarily the latter two. I mean, in, in Pericles, we have this kind of vision for a, a democratic society, or, or at least for democracy to the extent that it existed in, in ancient Athens. All three of these first authors were situated in, in ancient Athens, in the ancient world. I mean, Plato, of course, we have a, a almost allergic reaction to democracy. I mean, democracy is just the antithesis of, of his focus on, you know, the ideas and the, the eternal forms and, and, and such things. Democracy is nothing but rabble and change and passion and so forth. Aristotle also identifies democracy as a quote-unquote deviant constitution, but in his kind of uh, what he calls constitu constitutional republic or polity, he does recognize the importance of incorporating a uh, 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 aspect of, of the rule by the, of rule by the many in an ideal um, state. 
Augustine was a bit of an interlude here. I mean, he's what we would call what the late antique period. Uh, we looked at his distinction between the city of man and the city of God, and we saw the way in which the notion of the city of God enables a citizen to conceive of herself as standing to some degree outside of the structure of her society and put herself in a position to critique, uh, to criticize those structures where where that need might arise. And we think here of the example of someone like Martin Luther King Jr., who certainly saw his way um, clear to do that. Machiavelli, Hobbes, and Spinoza kind of fill out the early modern period for us. Machiavelli and Hobbes, you know, duke it out for the title of uh, founder of modern political philosophy, and they're no longer dealing with ideals or, you know, things to which our societies ought to conform. They're dealing with power. They're dealing with realistic assessments of material on the ground circumstances, hence they're, they're competing for this title of modern political thinkers. In Hume, Rousseau, and Kant here, numbers 15 to 19, we see thinkers of the Enlightenment. Uh, and, and certainly Hume and Rousseau were both great influences on Kant, and they're setting the stage for the period of the great resurgence of what we today call democracy in, in the American and French revolutions. Uh, we see those revolutions discussed um, here in readings from 20 to 25 or so. Um, talking about uh, or readings from Paine and from Burke. Benjamin Constant is in there as well. We have thinkers here at the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th trying to conceive of what, well, really just the 18th, uh, end of the 18th century, trying to conceive of what democracy would look like, uh, should look like in the modern period. From numbers 26 uh, down here to, let's say, well, let's say 37, the whole remainder of that page, uh, we're into the early American Republic and the 19th century, taking that, if we could, as a whole. We, we touched on Madison several times in this course. Certainly, he laid the groundwork uh, for much of the U.S. Constitution. We've seen um, Tocqueville already commented on him as a very important commentator on this, and he's joined by Mill. And we also had readings from Lysander Spooner, Frederick Douglass, Karl Marx, and Friedrich Nietzsche, um, uh, all exploring different themes in, in relation especially to uh, the relation between the individual and society, right? How does the individual find her place in a democratic society, or what responsibilities does she in fact have? Also, how self-aware are these so-called modern democracies? Are they in fact, as Marx or Nietzsche would, would suggest, these so-called masters of suspicion, are they in fact covering up the fact that they're not nearly so just and free and equal and so forth as they would like to think themselves to be? In numbers 38 to 41 here, or maybe 42, we have some early 20th century sources from Lenin, Carl Schmitt, Friedrich Hayek, Isaiah Berlin. All of these thinkers are navigating the, the, the interwar period, the, the immediate post-war period, uh, and continuing exploration of some of the themes from the 19th century figures. But then we conclude with Rawls and Nozick and Cristiano, what we would certainly call contemporary figures from the 1970s or so to the present who have really defined the space of democratic political theory in, in, in different ways and um, among, of course, many other authors. But these are the three that we've, that we've focused on uh, for reasons of their, of their prominence. And so that's going to wrap up our series, Debating Democracy. No maybe definite answers. Um, I'd like to be able to, you know, to give a, a bit more definite answer than perhaps we've done. But certainly I hope that exploring these materials and uh, especially reflecting on the themes of Jason Brennan's book uh, has equipped you to more fully or deeply understand uh, some of the crises facing our political societies today. Certainly this is a theme I would, I would enjoy exploring further. And uh, if, if you would like to see that, please uh, let me know. Thank you.